Well, g'day, curd nerds. G'day, curd nerds. Well, 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 g'day, curd nerds, and welcome to another Ask the Cheese Man. I'm Gavin Weber. I'm the Chief Curd Nerd, and I will try my very best to answer your cheese making questions. Uh, lots of people in the chat today, which is fantastic, very active. Lovely to see so many of you. Now, before we start, of course, uh, we uh, always do a shout out to our um, financial members. Uh, big shout out to Krogan Love. Thank you, Krogan. And we had a bit of an uh, email conversation during the week around Amish cheese um, and uh, Krogan has asked is um, has promised to send me some Amish cheese recipes so that should be very interesting I'll give those a go uh, also another shout out to another YouTube member uh, hell yeah we're homesteading interesting title but uh, yeah <laughs> uh, thank you so much for your financial um, assistance um, new patrons this week Robert just Robert, that's all we put. Thank you so much, Robert. And thanks to all of the YouTube members and patrons who support the show financially month on month. Uh, it really does keep the lights on around here and uh, helps Kim and I uh, produce these shows. Um, the cheese that will be released and working on today is Castel Blue. I was hoping to... Uh, hoping to fully mature it and all that sort of stuff, but I've, I've got some shots of it maturing and all that sort of stuff, but I haven't cut into it yet because it's not quite mature. So I'm going to release the video uh, in the next few days um, after the members and patrons have seen it first and then release it to the uh, general public. And um, uh, then I'll do a follow-up taste test, uh, but they're looking really good. They're looking really good, so I'm very impressed. And they do look creamy, so that's a good thing. All right, a bit of a shout-out. Let's have a look and see who's here. We've got, uh, early on the piece, I think first person off the cab off the rank was James. G'day, James. We've got Herb. We've got Kim, who's moderating today, my lovely wife. Uh, keep it clean, everybody, and uh, well-behaved. Uh, as we do normally anyway, which is fantastic. Uh, Charlie, g'day, Charlie. Lovely to see you. Um, Dominique, lovely to see you again, mate. Fantastic that you're here. Uh, Dan, hello, Dan. Uh, George, g'day, George. Kenny, Molly, hello, Molly. I think I've got some of your photos that I'm going to show in the gallery at 8.30. Um, who else we got? Kevin P. I think I've got some of your photos too, Kevin. Um uh, Elias, I think that's how you say it. We'll get to the questions in a second. Hello, Shiny from Northland, New Zealand. G'day, hello, Shiny. We've got three voyages homestead from uh, Victoria, British Columbia, I think, if I read that right. James, g'day, James. And Wind Wolf Alpha from Southern California. Lovely to see everybody on. Oh, and Bob Ward, of course. Uh, all right, so um, let's get into it before i do i've got a little bit of an announcement um oh a super chat already goodness me thank you so much uh and that was from jim as always uh thank you so much jim i appreciate it uh jim says g'day king gavin and queen kim this is my weekly donation to the cause i do hope that this finds you both in good health and happy uh indeed uh, i'm feeling pretty good uh, Jim, thank you for asking. And Kim doesn't feel too bad. She had her um, uh, COVID vaccine uh, Friday and she felt a little bit under the weather yesterday, but she's starting to feel a bit better today, which is great. So thank you so much for asking, Jim. All righty. Um, we've also got some Facebookers here. We've got uh, uh, Valin, Valin, I think that's how you pronounce it. Thanks, Valin, from Oklahoma. Uh, and we got Gary. G'day, Gary. How are you? Um, all righty. So, sorry, I had an announcement. What was it? I've been, um, uh, after that last uh, 
the uh, what was it? The truffle brie that I uh, I purchased from uh, Cheese Therapy and Cheese Therapy. Uh, Helen and Sam have both been on the show before, uh, and they were asking answering questions, which was fantastic. Uh, and um, uh, they Sam reached out. I think it was Sam reached out to me the other day and asked if I wanted to showcase. Uh, some of their cheeses on a you know a fairly regular basis. Um, we're working through the details. I think it would be fantastic because I get to try interesting cheeses that I've probably never tasted before, and I get to concoct a recipe, I suppose, and share it with you and try and make it myself. Uh, and also, all of the um, uh, the artisan cheese makers around Australia and wherever they get their cheeses from, I think they get some European cheeses as well. Uh, get the benefit of um, getting a little bit of a plug. So that's always cool. So we're working through the details at the moment. Uh, nothing official yet, but that will be great. All righty. Um, let's uh, answer some questions. I'm sure we've got some here. I have noticed some. Let's have a look. Um, uh, Oh, where are we? Um, here we go. Um, this is from Dan. Says, G'day, Curd Nerds. What's everybody making today? I'm making a little bird, a.k.a. Camembert. Uh, well done, Dan. Uh, I've actually got some pictures of uh, some uh, uh, Camembert in the gallery and some very interesting information which uh, you will probably uh, be surprised at. So that'll be good. I'll share that when we get there. Um. <clears throat> a question or more of a statement from George says, good evening all, sitting here with a pint of beer and the last of my petite blue on homemade sourdough. Well done. Um, there is a, another question. Uh, this question is from uh, Elias. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> Hi, can you tell us about kefir in making cheese? Uh, Yes, kefir is a um, a substance that contains some starter cultures. It contains, uh, I think, one mesophile, a, um, a thermophilic. It also contains geotrichum candidum. It's used sometimes in uh, cheese making when you can't get your hands on cultures. Um, I haven't been able to get my hands on some kefir grains uh, but there is a very good book by David Asher uh, that explains the total use of kefir grains. Um, it's worth getting if you have a readily readily, readily, readily supply of uh, raw milk and uh, if you can get your hands on some kefir grains, uh, that's probably all you need. Remember that in raw milk there are lots of native lactic bacteria uh, and kefir kind of like helps it on a little bit so the book is um oh what's the book hang on let me see if i've got it here there it is <clears throat> uh the art of natural cheese making um it's a pretty good book but if you can get f past the first few chapters where he talks about the evils of commercial cheese making and direct vat inoculated cultures, then uh, and that doesn't put you off, then you can get into the recipes and that's cool. All righty. Um, James has got a question. James says, uh, what's the best way to fine tune a ripening box? Uh, it's hard for me to keep mould at bay with kefilla. You warned us about it. Uh, lower humidity. Uh, yeah, if possible. So with kefili, because it only takes three weeks to mature, James, what I tend to do is every uh, a couple of days is um, uh, drain out the way at the bottom, uh, wipe the box dry and the mat, uh, spray the mat with a little bit of vinegar. Uh, that also helps keep any moulds at bay or moulds or yeasts that want to grow on the kefili. It's a very moist cheese. Uh, it tends to grow a lot of mould. Uh, as you know, um, but really it does need, as far as I'm concerned, to be naturally ripened. Uh, that mould's not that much of an issue. Uh, you've seen kefillis 
that have have white mold all over them but that doesn't go into the rind once because it's such a highly salted cheese the rind is very firm early on which is great um and i don't have too many problems when i make them uh but yeah to lower the humidity make sure you wipe out that ripening box uh, and get rid of any moisture within it uh every yeah every two days that's what i roughly do so i hope that helps james okay um where else uh rachel says yay for her being vaccinated hi from buffalo new york thank you rachel appreciate it um i'm not due for mine yet kim was in a high risk um uh category as far as you know health goes so uh it was best the government here in australia are doing it in phases I'm probably in the last phase and probably won't get mine till, oh, God knows when they've really stuffed up the rollout here of vaccines. But uh, Kim was in the second group, I think. So um, uh, she got hers, like I said, on Friday. But I won't get mine and neither will Ben for a long time. Um, but it's not so bad over here. You know, we've got zero cases in Victoria and haven't had any cases for, I think it's about 50 days or something. So pretty good managed to uh, kill it in its tracks, which is fantastic. Uh, Sonray says, I think it's how you say it. Uh, Hi, Gavin. I made Gorgonzola seven days ago, but there has been absolutely no blue mould growth so far. I dry salted with 3% salt and placed it in 90% humidity, 13 degrees Celsius. Any idea why the blue won't show? Um there's only one idea uh, that I've got. I haven't made Gorgonzola, but I've made many blues, as you know. Um, if it's too moist, if the cheese is too moist, and you can actually see the moisture on the cheese itself, the blue won't grow. It, it hates a really moist surface. It, it just doesn't grow. What will grow, though, will be Brevibacteria linens, uh, and that'll really stink your cheese cave out. Uh, and you won't get the desired cheese. So it's got to be fairly dry. Um, if you have a look at the cheese, if it's touch dry, then eventually by about 10 days, you'll start to see some blue growth. And 10 days is usually about the right period. Um, certainly on the um, uh, the Castile Blue that I've got growing in my cheese cave at the moment, it took about yeah, eight, nine, maybe 10 days before the blue started to show. Uh, I've had blues uh, show um, Penicillium Rogue 40 on the outside at five days, especially when you're doing something like a Stilton um, that is um, uh, hooped for five days at room temperature so you can get it to form. Uh, because the surface is so dry, the, the blue mold grows very fast. So if it's moist and you can see moisture, um, then pat it down with a paper towel all over uh, and uh, keep your ripening box fairly dry, uh, you will find that the blue mould will take off and you shouldn't have too many problems. If it doesn't grow at all, you don't... There's not much you can do. Honestly, you can't, like, spray blue mould over the top. It doesn't work that way. Um, what you can do is just mature the cheese as normal uh, and you'll have a very nice creamy cheese. It, it'll taste very nice. Um, I'd mature it for the same amount of time that you would normal gorgonzola anyway. Hope that helped. Okay. Um, Molly says, I make cream cheese. Went perfect the first time every time I make cream cheese. It doesn't set. And it, sorry, this is not making sense. Maybe I'm not reading it right. I made cream cheese. Went perfect the first time. Maybe there's a comma. Every time I make cream cheese, it doesn't set and it's still milk after 18 hours. Why? Good question. <laughs> Why? Uh, could be the milk, could be the uh, add a little bit more rennet. Um, if it's pasteurized, homogenized milk, then I would definitely add a little bit more rennet um, at the start. Uh, if the temperature is too cold uh, and it's not around 18 to say 21 degrees Celsius, at room temperature, then it will take a lot longer to set. I've had cream cheeses. I think the French cream cheese took like 36 hours. It takes a long time, uh, especially if the temperatures are fairly low. So hopefully that helps, Molly. 
Um, okay. Uh, this is from Herb. Herb says, my in my latest Asiago cheese, I used pH strips during the cooking phase to test. The pH didn't change much, uh, if at all. Pasteurised milk adding uh, calcium chloride, is that normal? Um, if by the cooking phase you mean uh, during stirring and stuff like that, yeah, that you should start to get a pH drop after about 30 minutes. Uh, if you've tested it um, from when it was milk, before you added any of the starter cultures, there should have been the slightest of change after the waiting time, the ripening time when you added the starter cultures, Herb. And you'd be lucky if it's a couple of decimal points drop. It really does start to kick in um, the acidity after a few hours, and then that may even be when it's in the mould. Um, remember, even when the cheese is in the mould, the uh, lactic bacteria are consuming the lactose and converting it into acids. So some cheeses, remember when you make something like a cultured um, mozzarella or provolone, it can take up to four to five hours for the pH to drop rapidly. Uh, which you need to, say, stretch the cheese. And I know that's different than Asiago, but, uh, yeah, it does take some time. Slowly, slowly at first until the colony of bacteria get big enough um, as they multiply and breed and eat the lactose. Uh, and then once they get to the right amount, they go for it. Anyway, I hope that helps her. Okay. Um, this question's from... Oh, Kinase uh, Films, I think that's how you say it, <laughs> other pronunciation. Um, hi, I am in isolation. <laughs> well, that's, that's everybody. But um, I can only buy milk. Um, okay, righto. So, uh, can I make some basic cheeses without endangering, endangering myself with the wrong bacteria? I don't really understand the question. If it's been, if you can only buy milk in and you're in isolation and it's pasteurized, homogenized, you won't have any issues with the wrong bacteria. Um, if you've bought some starter cultures and introduced them into the milk, then that's what will be in there because milk is fairly sterile after it's been pasteurized um, as far as lactic bacteria and molds and yeast go. Uh, so, yeah, I don't think you'll have any issues. Uh, Jenny has a question and says, uh, the thermostat on my fridge is now set to 12 to 15 degrees Celsius. What temperature should I have it set to? Uh, also, is it okay to let cultures work in the milk for a couple of hours or stick to the recommended times? Okay, uh, great question. Thanks, Jenny. <clears throat> um Look, the ideal temperature range is between about 11 and 13, maybe 14. My cheese fridge drifts between those temperature ranges. I don't have any issues whatsoever. If I want a cheese to be matured colder, I've got this little freezer section on the cheese fridge that uh, obviously has the condense, not the condenser, the, um, what's it called, the refrigerant, that, and that's how it makes the cheese fridge cold. If I stick my ripening box in there, uh, that's what I, it, it holds it at about seven to eight degrees Celsius. I've put my thermometer in there for a while. And uh, that's perfect for, say, uh, bloomy white cheeses um, like, you know, camembert and brie and, and those sort of ones, um, bloomy goat blue. Um, and down the bottom of the fridge, it's, it's a little bit warmer. Uh, don't ask me why my fridge kind of works in reverse, but yeah, you'll have to test it, test it with your thermometer and see where the best place is. Also, your other question is, is it okay to let cultures work in the milk for a couple of hours? Not really. Um, each cheese has uh, different acidities. Uh, the more acid the cheese is, the crumblier the final cheese is. Uh, so if you're making, say, a uh, a Gouda or an Edam or one of those washed uh, curd cheeses, you really don't want it very high in acidity at all. You want it uh, quite low, uh, so yeah, quite neutral. Sorry, not low, neutral. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, and you'll get that nice, smooth, creamy paste. However, if you want something really crumbly, then it, it has uh, more acid in it. So the longer you leave it during the ripening period, the long the the lower the pH is um, and therefore more acidic. 
So stick to recommended times. They're there for a reason. Okay. Um, Michael has a question and says, Hi, Gav. I made a brie that is four weeks old. Mm, nice. Uh, it is still very hard on the inside and has a nice white mould, but is very creamy just under the mould. I use homogenised pasteurised milk. What have I done wrong? Uh, nothing really, Michael. Um, Breeze take, because they're a bit bigger, uh, if you stuck to a, a bigger you know, size, then um, you will find uh, that it takes longer to ripen. Uh, what can happen um, uh, under the rind, if the temperature is too warm or too hot, uh, then you can find that it does um, start it starts from the outside in to ripen. So if it's going to be very runny under the skin, then, yeah, the temperature was too high during that initial moulding, mould development. Sorry. Okay. Moving right along. Um, <clears throat> There's a question from uh, Steve. Steve says, cheese man. That's me. Uh, they say you can eat any mould that grows on cheese. If so, does it also apply to yoghurt? Uh, well, that's not quite true. You can't eat any mould that grows on cheese. Uh, black mould is not a good thing. It is actually toxic. So that's why if you get black mould on your cheese, you should cut it off or kill it with um, vinegar. Not a good thing. Uh, pink mould's not so good either. It's a fluorescent mould and uh, uh, can cause some people to have upset tummy. So try and avoid that. Kill it off with salt and, sorry, our brine and vinegar wash. <coughs> uh, so, yeah, not all good. And uh, if you've got um, uh, mould on your yoghurt, I certainly would not eat it because, remember, yoghurt's a very moist dairy product. Uh, and any moulds that grow on that would not have been introduced uh, and probably aren't in your environment, I would throw the yoghurt away personally. That's just my personal opinion. I would not eat it. Okay, uh, question from Lord. He says, would there be any way to seal up holes or cracks in a cheese like butter or lard? Um, if you're doing a natural rind, it's pretty hard. Once you get a crack, it's not the best. But uh, what you can do is basically vacuum pack it. Once you vacuum packed, there's nothing going to get in. So that's that's the best solution. Easiest is always the best. Okay. Um, this is from uh, Marek. Says hi, Kurd. <laughs> uh, very very informal. Um, <laughs> greeting back from Poland, um, as always, great live annual videos. Do you have some recipe for Holland Gouda? Uh, one of the most interesting is old Amsterdam trying to find something. Uh, yeah, Kim has put a recipe up for Gouda in the YouTube chat. So if you're on, yes, you are on YouTube, so you can go and find that. Okay, um, let's have a look. Uh, here's a question from, oh, who's that from? A. Warslow uh, says, can I ferment most hard cheeses with herbs, olives, and veggies like jalapenos and dried tomatoes? Um, <clears throat> if they're dried only. Uh, really, you shouldn't use uh, fresh um uh, herbs and stuff in your cheeses dried is best uh the fresh kind of ferment uh and i found that with experience um but yeah if you've got anything and anything dried um i wouldn't add any anything with olive oil per se into the um uh, into the cheese like semi-sun dried tomatoes that sort of stuff make sure they're all dried out um and they're distributed evenly through the through the curd before you press Okay. Um, let's have a look. Uh, uh, this one's from Andrew. And Andrew says, um, I may be about to get my hands on nine litres of raw milk. Do you have any suggestions on what to make with it? 
any cheese your heart desires. Um, however, if you want to be a little bit safer, I suppose, then make a, a harder cheese that you raise to at least 48 degrees Celsius during the cooking process uh, of the curds and has to be aged longer than 60 days. That's the advice given to us, certainly here in Australia by uh, Food Standards Australia and New Zealand, uh, that that style of cheese doesn't have too many issues when using raw milk. I know that the French and the Europeans use so much, um, use a lot of raw milk, even in camembert and stuff like that. But remember, their, um, their milk is tested to the nth degree uh, and tested every single batch and every single day for um, bad bacteria like listeria and botulism and all that sort of stuff um, and E. coli. So uh, with the absence of testing, then uh, I would make uh, on the safe side, I would make something like a Romano or a Parmesan uh, or any of those hard style Italian cheeses, like I said, that you take the temperature up um, over uh, 48 degrees Celsius. I've got a, a super chat there, and this is from Dan. Thank you so much, Dan. Uh, it says, hi, Gavin. Have you ever made cheese infused with Porto? Would it be the same method as using wine? I think you mean... In Australia, we call it port, and there's two types, tawny port and vintage port. Vintage would probably be the best. And yes, you could use the same method as wine. You can either soak it, or what you could do is soak the curds in it before you press it. Um, if you're going to do the soaking like drunken cow, then soak it in the, in the wine for at least two hours before you get any uh, discernible flavour changes in the cheese as it matures. So, yeah, so give that a go. Thank you so much for your super chat. All righty, uh, getting back up to where we were. Um, all right, we talked uh, Andrew. Yep, we talked to Andrew. We've done that one. This one's from uh, George. And George says, G'day, Gavin. How important is the exactness of the temperature in the cave when you age using vacuum pack, it feels roughly right under the stairs in my flat, but I'm not sure it's okay overnight. <clears throat> um, like, like I said before, there's a temperature range that you can safely get away with, and that's um, between 11 and, say, 14 degrees Celsius. Anything higher than that, your cheese will start to sweat uh, oil, and that's no good. Any colder than that and the lactic bacteria will go dormant and your cheese won't mature properly. So that's what you're trying to aim for. What you can do is, you know, you can buy a fairly cheap thermometer uh, that you can uh, check whether what the minimum and maximum temperatures are over a 24-hour period. I think usually they're digital. And I've got one up on my shelf up here that I just use uh, I've got sensors throughout the house and in the cheese fridge. Um, but yeah, you can tell minimum and maximum temperatures over the last 24 hours. So you could use something like that to determine how cold it gets overnight. Okay. Um, Molly says, what cheese recipe would you recommend for a mild flavor? Thank you for the advice on the cream cheese. I believed, I believe it to be room cold room temperature <laughs> there you go so yeah like i said molly the colder the longer it takes um what cheese recipe will recommend for a mild flavor uh colby's fairly mild uh, my mold mild uh because you wash the any any of the cheeses where you wash the curd during the cheese making process so where you take out some of the whey and then you add some of some warm or maybe even cool water back in it depends on the recipe of course what that's doing is starving the lactic bacteria of lactose so it doesn't develop any more acid and makes a milder cheese um so that that's a, a really good cheese to start with so you know you could try uh, Edom, Gouda, Colby, um, and that's the notification for the gallery. Um, 
So, yes, yeah, so any of those washed curd cheeses, they're very mild if you're into semi-hard, hard cheeses. So give that a go. Kim's putting up links for Edom and stuff like that. Thanks very much, Molly. All right, so let's get into the gallery. I've got to find it. Here we are. Let's make it bigger. Uh, let's share my screen. <laughs> this always goes well. Um, okay, here we go. Uh, share the screen. No, let's share the window instead. There we go. Hopefully that comes up. There we go. Lovely. All righty. Share the screen. So um, we've got some great cheeses today, and I'll just um, – there's a bit of a blurb that goes with some of them. So the first one has a little bit of a blurb. Let me find that. Uh, okay. So this one is from – Somebody known as Cup of Tea Love. <laughs> Not sure uh, what the person's name is because I asked them and they wouldn't tell me. Uh, so Cup of Tea Love it is. Um, this is a uh, – oh, this one's called Bert and the other one's called Cam. Uh, uh, There's a bit of a story. Here we go. I made two camembert's affectionately called Cam and Bert. Tried two different techniques. With Cam, I carefully sliced – and ladled the curds, whereas with Bert, I chopped them into cubes. Cam is definitely more gooier than Bert, possibly too gooey, as he was running all over the plate once he got to room temperature, both very tasty. So this one is, uh, this is the the Bert, and what did you say about the Bert? Bert was chopped into cubes. So as you can see, it is... Um, it's firmer in the paste. Let me just see the next one, which is uh, the cam. So this one it was the ladled technique. So not, you know, I don't know how scientific it is, but it's, uh, you know, anecdotal evidence that the different methods of uh, cutting the curds makes a different cheese. So this one's runny. It looks really good, actually. I like the runny one uh, probably better than the other one, but... Obviously, there's less moisture in the in the curds, so therefore, uh, it's a less moister cheese. So, uh, they're the uh, the two camemberts. I'll just show you the first one again. So that's the one that had the cubes cut. You can see there's hardly any runniness at all. I would assume that it's the same time period that she's cut into the cheeses. She or he, not sure who it is, um, but yeah, very cool. Uh, and then uh, a little side note says, P.S. I've been home all week with a sick three-year-old and he requested we watch The Cheese Man. So we spent a few mornings cuddling up on the couch watching some of your videos, a little curd nerd in the making. <laughs> That's lovely. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. Um, moving right along, there's a couple more from Cup of Tea Love. This one's a kafili. And you can see this is after it's cleaned the rind off. Uh, which is good, and then that's the cheese. She cut the rind off, she or he, cut the rind off uh, and ate the cheese. You can see there's a nice, well, not thick, but a dark area around the outside of the cheese, if you can see my little arrow on the stream, my pointer. But, yeah, it's a darker and then the nice paste in the middle, but um, all accounts, uh, it looks amazing So, uh, and tasted amazing. Uh, she just couldn't. Um, she she couldn't make herself eat the rind, but yeah, I think I would have. I would have made it into a cheese sauce, but yeah, very cool. All right, so some photos from Daniel and uh, Daniel Price. This one is a Campanzola without the blue. He did pierce it. There looks like there's a little bit of blue in the middle, but the blue didn't uh, didn't grow very well. And I had the opposite with my Campanzola. The blue grew better than what the white mold did. Uh, so it's a very finicky little cheese to try and make. Uh, you would have to make it a few times before you perfect it, I would think. Um, but, um, yeah, it's it's a good cheese nonetheless. But, uh, yeah, you can give it a go. Uh, this is uh, a blue cheese that did work from Daniel, and it's a formed on bear. Uh, nice blue on the outside, a little bit of blue on the inside. Uh, the paste looks a bit of... A little bit too, uh, a little bit too crumbly. Maybe uh, could be high acidity during the the make, but and maybe too much starter culture. But 
It looks pretty good. Uh, I was certain that's very edible and looks lovely. Uh, this one's also from Daniel, and this is a, a Yalesburg. Let's get in a little. Can I get in closer? Let's have a look. Oh, there we go. Oh, there we go. So some nice um, eye development, uh, nice um, uh, well, it's moist cheese, looks lovely, and uh, by all accounts, uh, it was a delightful cheese to eat. So well done, Daniel. Uh, is there another one? Oh, and there's another one from Daniel. This one's a, a saffron-infused manchego, and what he's done is uh, he's used a manchego basket. You can get the moulds online. I don't have any in our store, but it's very hard to get here in Australia. But uh, that's definitely the shape of the manchego, the basket weave type thing. It looks pretty cool. What he's done is um, added a bit of paprika to some olive oil, and he's coated the cheese in that and will probably continue to do so during the ripening period. So it's a, a good method to keep mould at bay on your manchego, and it should taste oh, very excellent. Okay, this one's from Doug Robinson, and it's some bland that he's made uh, from the whey left over from a uh, queso fresco. Uh, so he's got it bubbling away. It looks very similar to mine. <laughs> uh, mine is actually cleared now or, or nearly cleared. So what I'm going to do next weekend, I'm going to leave it for another week. It's stop bubbling, stop fermenting. Um, it's I'm going to rack mine into another demijohn, leave that for, say, another month and see what happens. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so very cool. Uh, well done. I hope it all turns out well, Doug. Uh, this is another cheese. This is the queso fresco that he made. Uh, looks absolutely delightful. And some quick mozzarella that Doug also made turned out uh, very nicely by the looks of it. Okay, what have we got here? This one's from Kim Wilson, and she's made the uh, the fiery um, triple pepper jack. Oh, I'll tell you what, that brings back memories, that cheese, I'll tell you. Uh, so hot and fiery. Uh, but, yeah, she's done the chipotle ripe rub on the outside or whatever chilli she's used. It looks pretty fiery. Uh, and that's the triple pepper jack before uh, it was rubbed with the chilli rub on the outside. Uh, it is, uh, it's got some chilies on the inside. It's air drying under the little umbrella, which, by the way, is a great tool uh, to keep any beasties away during air drying. I use those uh, all the time for all my air drying you probably see that this one's from molly blake who's in the chat g'day molly um this one is a kefili looks like it's been salted i can see some salt on the top uh, a little bit dark but that's okay and this is the kefili after it's been cut uh and molly said it tasted great this is a cotswold made by molly as well uh you can see the chives there i'm not sure which recipe she used whether it was the first one I made or the second one with the garlic flake, uh, garlic, uh, granulated garlic. Uh, but either way, both recipes, very nice cheese indeed. And you can see uh, that she's cut into it there and that looks perfect. So well done, Molly. Great looking cheeses. Oh, another one from Molly. This is, uh, yeah, this is the cream cheese with bacon and walnuts. And she's got it wrapped in cling wrap or saran wrap, saran, whatever it's called. Um, but, yeah, that's a great-looking cheese, and just take the wrap off it, and uh, bingo, boingo, you get to eat it. But bacon and walnuts, mm, very nice. Looks like it was based on that recipe that I made that um, cheese log with. Okay. Uh, that Thank you, phone, for reminding me about the gallery again. Righto. So this is a petite blue from Kevin P. I think Kevin could be in the chat, but uh, this looks almost exactly like the one I made. Uh, fantastic, great blue coverage on the outside. Looks a little bit creamy, I can tell from, you know, the cuts in the paste. And there it is after he scraped the blue off. Very creamy inside indeed. Uh, looks really nice. And there it is. There's a cross cut through it. And, uh, yeah, it looks fabulous. I have great memories of the Petite Blue. It was such a delicious little cheese. So if you take the time, you know, it's not pretty, but it's very, very tasty. It's a great-looking cheese. Um, okay, all right. So last week we talked about stirring um, 
uh, automatic stirrers. And I've got a, the photos were sent in by somebody who didn't tell me their name either. I think it was Joey, could have been Joey uh, off the top of my head. But um, I also got a follow up from a good friend, Chris Brand. And um, so this is what we're talking about. This is called the stir mate. Um, I don't endorse it. Uh, I've never used it. So don't rush out and buy them um before i read this out this little caveat anyway it's a little tool it's got a um, lithium-ion battery in it you recharge it uh this wire attachment you can see here is for larger pots is actually doesn't come with the initial unit you actually have to purchase this separately but anyway let me just read a little bit about this stir mate thing chris uh has had a fair bit of experience he says i've been using the stir mate pot stirrer for a while uh, it's okay, but you just have to learn how to use it. You still have to stir for the first half to three quarters of an hour just to firm up the curds. If you use it from the get-go, you will fracture most of the curds. It is mainly useful for long stir type cheeses, uh, like say Parmesan, Romano, that sort of stuff, I would say. Even when you have, uh, even when you have, to stop it now and again to give the curds a break up from the clumps because obviously it clumps. The stir mate needs to have a variable speed plus a change in stirring direction function, uh, of which it obviously doesn't. Uh, it is okay, but not brilliant and probably not really necessary. It's just convenient. Well, thanks, uh, Chris, for that um, review of the stir mate. Like I said, if you think it'll work for you, then uh, you go for it. You do you. And, um, yeah, uh, I personally won't be getting one, uh, but it works for some people, which is fantastic, and that, that's okay. Some people need a little bit of assistance. I know sometimes my hands get very sore when stirring, but, uh, yeah, it's just part of the cheese-making process. Anyway, thank you to everybody who sent in lovely gallery photos. If you want to send in a gallery photo, let me just show you how we do that. Um, if my computer works, <laughs> let's have a look. Uh, let's go and find me on the YouTubes. Righto, let's just share this. Um, okay, uh, where's my screen sharey thing again? And we'll share the window. Rightio. So, uh, this is the YouTube channel without me being logged on. Uh, yeah, thanks. Yeah, that's just a hint to draw, join. Uh, but what you do is to get the email to send me the um, uh, the photos, just go to the About tab of the channel just here. And down here, you can see it says Details, and uh, it says Sign in to see the email address. So you've got to be signed in to your Google account and you'll be able to see the email address to send me your cheese photos if you like. Uh, no obligation, of course. You don't have to if you don't want to, but it's a great little segment. I really do enjoy the um, uh, the gallery, and, uh, yeah, we get great photos. And you can see what other cheese makers are doing as well, uh, using my recipes or not using my recipes. I, I don't mind either way. Just shoot your cheese-making pictures through. Uh, it's always great to see. So thank you so much, everybody. All righty. Um, we have some more questions, of course. Uh, the time is 43 minutes past the hour, so about 17 minutes left. Uh, Tim has a question. He says, um, speaking of mould, Gavin, what is your favourite blue cheese? Um, I must say that the buttermilk blue uh, surprised me, the buttermilk blue that I made. Uh, and Kimmy, if you can pop up the link to buttermilk blue, that would be fantastic. It was a delicious cheese. Uh, the curd didn't set very well at all, but um, I drained it and put it in a mould. And I tell you what, it was a very, very nice cheese. So that kind of surprised me. Unique flavour, very creamy, very rich. Uh, great little cheese, the buttermilk blue. So, uh, But all the blue cheese, I've never had a bad blue cheese, I don't think, that I've made. Some have had a bit of a runaway effect, whereas the rind gets uh, very soft, very mouldy. But once you scrape that off, no big deal. Another surprise blue that I really enjoyed, besides the petite blue recipe that I made myself, 
um, was the farmhouse cheddar blue, where I made a farmhouse cheddar, and during the make, I added in some penicillium roke 40 powder to the milk, uh, and then I uh, I pierced the um, farmhouse cheddar, the farmhouse cheddar, um, at about when I started seeing mold growth on the outside, and there was some lovely marbling through the middle. It still had a cheddar flavour, uh, but it had that slight blue marbling, and it was quite nice. I could have aged it a bit longer, I suppose, if I wanted a more pronounced blue flavour, but it, it was perfect. It really was. It was a fine balance between blue and cheddar. So very nice. Uh, hope that answered your question. All righty. <clears throat> um, Lordy says, have I ever tr uh, thought of making Brie de Melon? Melon? Melon. Uh, no, I have not. Uh, I only have a recipe for Brie, basic Brie. Uh, so no, I don't have any recipes for variants thereof. Um Herb has a question or a statement. Said I've made raw milk cheeses and they were eaten at the thirty to forty-five days, no problem. It really depends on your milk source. My raw milk source is awesome in Texas. Uh, yeah, that's look, that's true, Herb. But you know, I've got to uh, caution people, uh, and I try to give the best answer I can. But yeah, you do what you like, um, and that's that's not a criticism. Uh, people have been making raw milk cheeses for thousands and thousands of years uh, without too many issues at all. Okay, a uh, question from Denise, and Denise says, Hi, Gavin, my first, I'm aging my first cheese, Kefili, and I have some red and pink mould growing. Ooh, uh, I'm doing a brine wash every other day, and yesterday added in vinegar. It still feels nice and firm. I can't attach a photo, but does this seem okay? Yeah, just keep washing it with that um, that brine every every few days. Uh, it'll keep the mould at bay. Uh, like I said, it, it grows mould like you wouldn't believe, the good old kefili, but uh, it's a fantastic cheese. But, yeah, we'll keep the mould at bay. The red and pink, not so bad, as long as you keep it wiped off. Um, like I said, it only ages for three weeks, so it's no big deal. You won't have too many issues of mould making the inside of the cheese runny or anything like that. Okay. Um, Hello, Shiny has a question. And says, I've been making cream cheese a lot, just basic farmer's cheese, uh, taking milk to almost boil and adding vinegar. It's always quite heavy and grainy. Any tips on how to make it more creamy? Uh, hate to break it to you, that's not cream cheese. That's more of a, what's known as a sweet ricotta. And yes, it is grainy. That's the way it is. The more vinegar you add, the more grainy the cheese becomes. The less vinegar you add and just get it to splitting into curds and whey, the more creamy it will be. Now, some ricottas are known to have cream added to them, and you can certainly do that if you like. However, if you want a truly a true cream cheese, then you can follow the cream cheese recipe that Kim is going to put the link in the YouTube chat uh, just for you. And trust me, uh, even the fr the French cream cheese, Kim, if you can find that one, uh, that is the king of cream cheeses and tasted absolutely fantastic. So give that a go. Hello, Shiny. What you're making at the moment is sweet ricotta. All righty. Um, <clears throat> here's a question from Three Voyages Homestead. Have you ever heard of Edam cheese? Uh, and if so, have you made it before? Love your channel. Yes, indeed. I think Kim's put the link to the Edam cheese down below, which is fantastic. Thank you, Kimmy. Um, hello, Shiny says, where's the best place to buy cultures online? Uh, that's up to you uh, as long as they are shipped. But what I can show you is we sell cultures here at littlegreenworkshops.com.au uh, and you can get your cheese making supplies over there. I've put the link up on the screen just for you. Okay. Um, uh, and I'm up to where everybody says the gallery stuff's great, which is good. Um, let's have a look. Um, see if there's any more questions. This one's from David. And David states, thank you so much for your fantastic channel. I've wanted to make 
I've wanted to make cheese in a fridge in a outbuilding, but it's just been too cold. Uh, I bought freeze-dried cultures in autumn. Should I just bin them or buy new? Uh, no, if you've kept your starter cultures in the freezer, they'll be good for a few years, honestly, as long as they are not gluggy uh, when you open them. If they're still in a powdered form, they should perform okay. Uh, and I've just got a super chat. We'll get to that one in a sec, Paul, but thank you so much for your $20 super chat. Um, so, you know, the the cheese, if it's been too cold in the fridge, then you'll need to get yourself an external thermostat, which you can just plug your fridge into. It's very basic. You set the temperature, put the probe inside. You've got a fairly long cable to it. Put the probe in the fridge. I just put it through the seal and hang it through the top. And it basically switches your fridge on and off at the right temperature. Um, so, yeah, don't but don't bend your starter cultures. Um, Hello Shiny says, will mascarpone work with vinegar as well as lemon? Uh, mascarpone uses tartaric acid to, um, uh, to congeal the cream into or coagulate the cream into mascarpone without the whey being extruded or extruded. <laughs> expressed i suppose that's the word uh but yeah mascarpone use a tartaric acid um okay uh we'll get to the super chat hang on where, where'd it go let's go there it is that's from paul thank you so much mate um gavin i made my first cheddar non-raw early uh 2020 and either the temperature or culture errors it was very acidic smell i opened it up at 12 months and while it seemed better, is smell still acid smelling? Um, keep aging or dump. Thanks. Uh, my question to you, Paul, is what does it taste like? If it tastes okay, uh, then yeah, the, the smell of cheeses usually dissipates if you let them air dry or, or sit out in the open uh, for an hour at room temperature, and you most of the the say ammonia or acidic smell or, or any any off smells that you think are there if it smells like manure then throw it away it's obviously rotten um but if it, it's just got a funny little smell then yeah i just let it sit on the on a board before i serve it up and if that goes away and the taste and the cheese tastes good then yeah it'll, it'll be fine but uh hope that helps mate um Maybe uh, uh, with the, the if it's really crumbly, uh, at twelve months cheddar is usually crumbly, but um, it may may have had too much acid development, or maybe too much starter culture. So that, that's a hint. Hopefully that helps. But thank you so much for your super chat. Okay, um, uh, where are we? Let's have a look. Um, Oh, we've got some more questions. How many minutes have we got left? I've got seven minutes to go. Um, uh, Lordy, uh, let's have a look. Lordy says, uh, Rennet plus raw milk and you've got a great cheese. Indeed. So if you leave raw milk um, at room temperature for 12 hours, roughly, uh, just make sure it's covered, of course, and then add it, the, you'll run it the next day, then you'll find that it will set because it's acidified a bit overnight using the natu natural lactic bacteria. Um, this won't work so well out of, straight out of the fridge because it hasn't had time to acidify at a warmer temperature. But uh, yes, yeah, the milk acidifies overnight uh, and uh, add your rennet and then get into the cheese making process and you should be good to go. Uh, obviously heat it up as per the recipe and all that stuff, but skip the culturing part where you add, you know, the direct vat inoculated starter culture because it's already in the milk. It makes a good cheese. Okay. Um, yeah, where else? I've got another question. Um, uh, Sue says, uh, hi, Gavin, have you ever made white Costello? No, I haven't. Uh, and white Costello cheese is very, very similar to Camembert, by the way. It's just made in um, uh, the uh, made in Denmark compared to France. 
So very, very similar recipe, actually. So, yeah, uh, enough said. There's a lot of copying going on in the Europe, of course. Um, uh, Molly says, um, thank you, Gavin. I use the original recipe for Cotswold, and my uh, it's my boyfriend's new favourite cheese is the chive and bacon cheese. Thank you for sharing my photos. No problems at all, Molly. My pleasure. Um, uh, there's uh, James says, I've watched one cheese maker that only stirs with her hands. Keep it clean. Remember the stories of whiskey yeast coming out from underneath someone's fig fingernails. In fact, they, yeah, they used to, uh, James, um, in the old days. Uh, that, that's what they used, the hands, because what they could do, they could feel the size of the curd. They could see if it was clumping together, and if it clumped together, they broke it apart, obviously. Uh, but, yeah, you've got to make sure that your fingernails, like mine, are spotless uh, and clean and make sure your hands are washed before you even dive in there. Uh, my hairy arms are not so good for shoving my hand into, um, uh, into a big vat of uh, curds and whey, but... Uh, and if the hairs come off, they're obviously going to go on the cheese, aren't they? So, um, yeah, that's a bit of an issue for me. So that's why I use a spoon. Uh, okay. But, yeah, I've seen videos of people doing old-style cheese making and, and do that. And as Bruce rightly says, if you're on YouTube, get the likes in. If you're on Facebook, give it a thumbs up. That would be fantastic. Thank you so much. Um uh where are we let's have a look um somebody uh the funny name h7 apollo i think it's how you say creme fraiche uh indeed there is a recipe for creme fraiche on the site kimmy i don't know if you've put it up there uh you can please do that that will be lovely uh we've got three minutes to go i'm not going to get to everybody's questions i apologize for that kim's given me the wind up uh, if you want to show your support, then over on Patreon and get some reward tiers, uh, you can go over to patreon.com slash greening at Gavin. That's the page for my Patreon. Uh, you can support the show financially. Uh, you can buy the merch. If you're on YouTube, there's a merch shelf down below already. On Facebook, you can go to cheesemantv.creator-spring.com and that will get you to my merch store. Um, thank you so much. I don't know if Kimmy's bringing in young Hamish. Could be. Uh, I don't know during the show if you've seen Holly. She's been, oh, wrong side, sitting in the chair down here, having a bit of a sleep. But I can hear Hamish. He's coming. Uh, for all those who don't know my little dog, Hamish. Yes, come in. Come in. Here he is. Hello, Mr. McTavish. Come here. Oh, this is Hamish. This is a West Highland Terrier puppy. Say hello to the camera, Hamish. Hello. There he is. Um, beautiful little boy, and uh, he likes cheese as well. So he'll be featuring, when he calms down a bit and grows up a little bit, he'll be featuring in some of the cheese-making taste tests as well. Won't you, mate? Yes, Dad. Righto. Well, there we go. All right. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Uh, we'll call it a wrap. Uh, but thank you, like I said, uh, without your questions, there wouldn't be a show. Um, Kim's got the squeakiest door and left it open. But anyway, um, without your questions, there wouldn't be a show, as I said. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for coming back, watching this old bloke answer your cheese questions week after week. Uh, it's fantastic. Um, and it really does warm the cockles of my heart. And uh, Kim really enjoys doing the moderation part as well. So thank you so much. Uh, we will possibly not be having a show next week. It's the 25th of April, and those who know Australia, it is Anzac Day, which is like Veterans Day and Memorial Day uh, in the US and Canada, um, or, or Remembrance Day, same sort of thing. So we have Anzac Day over here, 25th of April. Um and uh, yeah, so I'll be because um, I was a I was a veteran um, of twenty years in the Royal Australian Navy. I will there's I don't think there's a march or anything this year, but I'll be standing outside with my medals on and uh, having a one minute silence at dawn 
so I may not have a show. We'll see. Um, I'll see if maybe if the chain times change. I don't know. But I may not. I might um, uh, postpone it for next week. But uh, just watch the announcements on YouTube and Facebook uh, for when the next show is airing. But thank you so much. Uh, appreciate all of your time. Uh, until next time, uh, this has been Gavin and this has been Ask the Cheese Man. See you later.